we uh, have a very, very sp special treat for you. Please welcome all the way from the States, Mr. Mike Rice. Hello, everybody. Thanks for that awesome, warm introduction. <laughs> no, seriously, and Nils, thank you for the introduction outside. That was great. Um, okay, catch my breath here for a second. So hello everybody, my name is Mike Wise. If you're not familiar with me yet, I'll tell you my story in just a second. I'm just gonna introduce my topic today. We're gonna be talking about legalization in the US. And so it's gonna be from a little bit of a different perspective than you might have heard before. I think most of you guys, if you go on the internet or read a magazine from the United States, you're gonna hear a perspective on cannabis legalization from big businesses. You're not gonna hear the perspective from patients and from activists. People like myself are kept out of these magazines because they don't want us to tell you the message of what's really going on. So I hope that's a spicy introduction for you guys and I'll get right into it. Um, so my name is Mike Wise. Um, I first got into cannabis, I've been Consuming, I've been smoking cannabis for 20 years probably at this point, about 18 years. Uh, I used to smoke constantly. I would smoke 25 grams in a week. Um, and I wasn't really sure why I needed to do this. A lot of people would look at me crazy when I would tell them this, and they'd be like, what? That's so much, so much weed that you're smoking. Why do you smoke? How are you alive? How are you functioning? Um, and so someone like myself, I develop a tolerance, and so the THC doesn't affect me psychoactively like most people might have it affect them. And I think if, if you consume cannabis regularly, you'll notice this effect too, that the psychoactivity really kind of goes away. Um, and so it turns out I was a sponsored skateboarder previous in my life. No, you're good. I was a sponsored skateboarder. And so I was on the road a lot. I was moving around, traveling everywhere. And in the United States, we have a lot of fast food chain restaurants. And so someone who's in a hurry, this is like a perfect option for me. And I was able to get food quickly and cheap. The problem is, is the food was cheap also. It's cheap, cheap food, cheap quality ingredients. Um, and this is what we see on every corner. There's McDonald's, Wendy's, Whataburger, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a different fast food place everywhere. And uh, actually here in Europe, I'm noticing they use better quality ingredients. In the United States, they use a lot of genetically modified ingredients and things that are just not, I, in my opinion, I don't think humans should be putting in their body, much less eating. So I was traveling a lot, eating bad food, and smoking a lot. And it's because my stomach would always feel bad. I'd always have uncomfortable feelings in my stomach, bloating, uncomfortableness, I'd have to belch or burp quite often, um, and so at first it wasn't so bad, but after about 10 years of living this kind of lifestyle, it started to get really bad, and I would have to go to the restroom quite often to vomit, so it was hard for me to ever really want to eat a meal, because as soon as I would eat, I'd pretty much throw up, I'd throw up my food, because um, I was eating bad food, I think my, my body was just rejecting this. It didn't want it inside of me. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so it turns out that I have I developed Crohn's disease from the, living this type of lifestyle. And Crohn's disease, you might not be familiar with it so much over here in Europe, but it's like an inflammation in your digestive tract and in your bowels. And so anytime I would eat, my inflamed like intestines would kind of not like the food. And I'd throw up, and, um, but this is a problem because if I didn't eat, then I would also throw up, which was kind of a weird concept. So um, if I didn't end up eating every four hours or so, I'd, I'd have to go to the restroom and throw up. And so this is not a life that a human can live. I can't be at a public event and speaking to people if I have to be in the restroom vomiting and throwing up all the time. It's just not something I can do. And um, so, I guess I'll make that a little shorter, fast forward a little bit. In 2014, I moved to Colorado from Texas. Um, I actually went to jail in Texas, and I spent two years in jail for cannabis possession. Um, 
So even in the United States still, my friends, my relatives, um, people I know are still getting arrested and going to jail for cannabis. It's not everything legal right now. Um, and so when I moved to Colorado, I began to film a documentary called Illegally Alive. And this documentary, we're giving it away for free. It's on YouTube. You can watch it, Illegally Alive. And it's the story, we follow a few families who had to move to Colorado to get access to medical cannabis for their children. And the main character of my story, he had Crohn's disease. And this is when I started find, finding out about Crohn's disease. I didn't even really know what it was. And so I started learning about it and seeing the symptoms. And it turns out I had all these same things that, that the main character of my story had. And he was using a tincture, which is kind of like the CBD oil that you can buy here today, but he was using a THC version, which is still not so strong. It's mixed with hemp seed oil or something. It's not pure. And um, so when I was filming this, this documentary, I started hearing a lot about Rick Simpson. And I started hearing a lot about Rick Simpson oil. And so when I started researching it, it turns out that there's this man, he used, he used high THC cannabis oil to cure his cancer. He had skin cancer, and he was able to cure that with high THC cannabis oil. And so after researching it a little bit, I was like, well, if the oil that, that you know, he's popularized and he's made, if this works for cancer, what will it do for Crohn's disease? That was my question. I wanted to know. I mean, if this, is, if this can cure, kill the most serious disease we know, it should be able to, to kill my disease also. So I ended up doing the protocol like Rick states a little bit differently. I ended up doing 90 grams of cannabis oil in 120 days. And now I'm symptom free. I'm here today to be able to talk to you. As you can see, I'm not having to run to the restroom and vomit. If you've been seeing me, I'm at my stand at the booth all day, standing around, talking to all you beautiful people. And it's because of cannabis. Um, if I didn't know about this oil, then I wouldn't be here. So this is why I want to, this is why I'm a part of cannabis. This is why I travel all around the world speaking about cannabis, because it really gives me my life back. And so I have a page online, and it's called The Mike Wise Show. It's on Facebook, that's our main place. But we also have Instagram and YouTube and other places. And uh, I've kind of created a resource, a portal, uh, a place for patients to come and find all the information they need about medical cannabis without someone trying to sell them something or trying to convince them that this is the best thing because they're trying to sell you something. Really, that's what it comes down to. A lot of what you see in the cannabis industry is people trying to sell you something. And so when it comes to the message of legalization, it's no different. Um, the magazines all want to paint this beautiful picture like a Hollywood movie that everything is great and cannabis is legal and everyone can grow it and everyone's free and everyone can buy cannabis and there's no problems. Um, unfortunately, this is not the case. And so I'll kind of tell you the perspective of legalization in Colorado from what I saw as an activist, as a patient. When cannabis gave me my quality of life back, I went to the parliament building in Colorado every week to talk about cannabis to, to the politicians. And there is normally some law they're trying to make to restrict cannabis. And it wasn't always this way. First in Colorado, we had an amendment called Amendment 20. And the way we were able to get medical cannabis to Colorado was not by asking a politician to do it for us. We have a, a referendum system. So if enough people can sign their name onto a paper saying, we are for this, we want to put this for a vote, we want the people to vote about this issue, then we can do this in Colorado. And so they had tons of signatures, over 100,000 signatures, and they were able to get Amendment 20 onto the ballot for the people of the state to vote on. So no politician was involved in it. And it was pretty clean and easy to understand language. Um, Basically, it allowed you to be able to go see a doctor, and the doctor would determine how many plants you would need for your specific disease. Seems pretty common sense. Seems like that's how it should be. Well, for eight years or so, the medical program flourished. It was great in Colorado. Um, I, when I moved there, I could grow 99 plants, because my doctor said I could grow 99 plants. This was the most that one person was allowed to grow 
without any type of special permit. They could just go to their doctor, pay the fee to see the doctor, and if he said you're, you should grow this, then you can. And you can explain that you need to make it edibles and lotions and maybe you're juicing raw cannabis, which is why you need more plants, 99 plants. And that was what the law allowed, up to 99. They also had a pretty cool thing where with signing very little paperwork and really no license procedure, you wouldn't have to pay extra money, really, you can become a caregiver. And so that's what I was in Colorado, I was a caregiver. And under this designation, I could take five patients who also were deemed to grow 99 plants from their doctors, and I could grow the plants for them. So without having to spend thousands of dollars on a license and all of this kind of thing, I myself was able to grow 495 plants in Colorado. This was 2014 when I moved there. Um, I did this, I made oil for patients, and around 2014, uh, well, no, maybe, yeah, 2014, around that same time, this is when we voted on Amendment 64 in Colorado. And this is where things started to change. Um, in my opinion, this is where patients really started to get screwed by the system, screwed by the politicians, screwed by big businesses. It all started with this passage of Amendment 64. And it was a similar thing where enough people signed their signature on a form saying, let's vote for it. And what Amendment 64 is, what you guys will probably most commonly know it as, is recreational cannabis. So we had recreational cannabis get voted in 2014. As soon as that happened, there was an immense amount of legislation and a tremendous focus on restricting the rights that Amendment 20 had previously provided to patients. As soon, in my opinion, as soon as the big businesses and the dispensaries started to come in and sell cannabis, they no longer wanted me and you to grow it so easily. They wanted us to go buy it from their store. Um, this, this presents many problems to me as a patient. I'm not anti-business in any way, shape, or form. Business should thrive. I love business. The problem is I believe in business and business ethics. And in cannabis, in the cannabis industry, and I guess in many industries in America, it seems that ethics is not really playing a part in business no more. People just want to make money as quickly as they can and as much as they can. And so in cannabis, this can be really detrimental to patients. We're using this as a medication. We're trying to put this plant into our body so we can get better, so we can feel better, so we can cure ourselves or fix symptoms that we might have. Well, a dispensary or someone who is only interested in making money, someone who's only interested in the bottom line, they don't care about how you feel. They just want you to buy. And so what they'll do is they'll spray pesticides. And a lot of times when you, have, when you grow cannabis in an industrial setting, unless you're an experienced grower, it's hard to do this without pesticides. And so in Colorado, we noticed a lot of these businesses weren't really trying to even hire experienced growers. They were just trying to hire somebody that they could pay, you know, a wage that's acceptable, more of like a minimum type of wage. So you really don't have master growers in your dispensaries. You have someone who's willing to take 20000 a year or 50000 a year and do what the boss tells you to do, not let the grower tell the boss how the plants are supposed to be. Instead, the boss tells the grower what's supposed to happen. So you end up having a bunch of poisonous, carcinogenic pesticides being sprayed on our plants. So the very plants that we're eating to try to kill cancer are being sprayed with substances that cause cancer. That in and of itself presents a huge problem to patients. So as you can see, not everyone knows what I'm telling you. And it's the same thing in the United States. A lot of people don't know the activist perspective. They only know what they see in the magazines and, uh, and in the TV and in the news. And so they go and buy this weed, you know, because it's, it's easy for them to buy it now. You don't have to have a, a medical card. You can just go to the store and buy it if you're over 21 years old. And um, it's, it does cause many more problems besides that. Um, testing, cannabis testing. <coughs> costs money. Dispensaries don't want to pay extra money if they don't have to. So a lot of the times you have stores and people who own stores that sell cannabis 
actively trying to get around the laws about testing it because they don't want to spend the money. They don't want you to know that this pesticide is on their plant. They don't want you to know that it has mold. And so in Colorado, it got really sinister, I guess is the best way I could put it. Um, testing, at the time I left, which was in 2016, <laughs> testing was left up to the owner of the dispensary. So you can have a huge facility that's 1,000 meters, all with cannabis. And all of it can have disease all over it and mold. But one little tiny plant in the corner can be good. And this is a good plant. So you can take three samples off of that plant and you send those three samples in to get tested. And then there you go, you have a clean plant. Everything you, is, you have is clean because it's tested. Um, this is another problem that I see um, for patients is because we can't trust their testing. The only way that you will know what's in your garden and what's in your plant and what you put in your body is if you grow it yourself or you know the person very well that does it. Um, so businesses, they don't care about this. They want you to buy. They want you to buy, 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 buy. If you're growing it yourself, you're not buying it. You're not buying it from them. So by the time I left Colorado in 2016, only two years later after I got there, I was only allowed to grow 12 plants in my house. And it wasn't just me, that's now the law. Everywhere, in all of Colorado, you cannot have more than 12 plants in one house. It doesn't matter, let's take this um, devil's advocate type of situation. Let's say you, you have children, maybe you have two children and they both have autism. Well, it doesn't matter if the doctor says this children can have 99 plants for his autism and this child can have 99 plants for his autism. It doesn't matter, you can only have 12 plants in your house. So then you have to choose, well, which child am I going to give medicine to, you know? Or you have to go buy it. That's, that's the only option. And, um, and they did this after recreational laws came in, after big businesses came in, after they found out they could make money off of this, the people who are making money then went to the politicians and they went to the bureaucrats and they said, hey, maybe you should change this law because, you know, it's not safe for children or something. They will even use reefer madness kind of logic that's been used against us. They will use it to go back to the politicians and say, yeah, don't let people grow in their house because it's dangerous. If you grow in your house, you can start fires. And, and you know, this is bad. And so the politicians go and they continue to say this. And they say, okay, well, n now people cannot grow in their house because it's bad and you can burn down your houses. And everybody repeats this. And so now we have this law passed where you can't grow in houses. Now you can't use high pressure sodium lights. I think you can only use LED lights. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of things happening, and it was pretty. It was really every week. I was not exaggerating when I said I went to Parliament every week. There was a new law trying to be passed to restrict the rights of medical cannabis patients that we once had under Amendment 20. So um, after, so in my opinion, after these recreational laws came through. They really destroyed kind of the progress that we had made as cannabis activists. And so we actually experienced kind of less freedom than you would before. Um, yes, you can go to the store and buy weed without a card, but before it wasn't difficult to obtain a card. You could go to the doctor and for 60 euros, you can tell them, oh, you have sleep problems, you have pain or something. It's pretty easy to get a medical card. They wouldn't deny you this. So it wasn't like it was a difficult thing where we must have recreational and everyone needs to just go buy it. But that's kind of how it was portrayed in the media. <coughs> so the same thing I, is, I'm not as, I don't know as much in California, but the same thing happened in California. Um, they had Prop 215, I believe, and it was another thing they passed, which was a referendum type situation. And it was in the year 2000. They were the first state to pass cannabis, uh, medical cannabis laws. And that's where I got my first card, actually, was in 2008. I got off the plane and went down to Venice Beach. And within 30 minutes, I had a card. So, I mean, it's not like this was a hard, difficult thing to do. I didn't even live in California. I was from Texas. And so they had, I think it's amendment, Prop 64. So another recreational law came in. And since then, all the kind of freedoms that they used to enjoy, they're also getting restricted. They used to be able to do tons of events. There used to be lots of high times cups and all sorts of chalice cups and all sorts of things um, 
going on in California, and now that's being restricted. Also, California was huge about home growing. Humboldt, Humboldt County was like the mecca for growing cannabis in the United States. Since their Amendment 64, Prop 64 came in, those farms have been getting raided daily. They're trying to shut down all the mom and pop farms and only let the big businesses come in. And they even really are making it harder for mom and pop type businesses too, who might have the leg up and might have an investor or something. They even make it harder for those people because the bigger businesses come into the legislators. So every few months, they'll say that your dispensary will need to change all the air conditioning or all your ventilation. That's like a 50,000 euro change you need to do in one week. And if you can't do it, then you have to close. And so these smaller businesses who might still be big, and <laughs> they are shutting down daily. <coughs> and so the moral of the story, I guess, the, to bring that point home is to, to know what you're advocating for. And don't ever get complacent. We had so many activists in the United States and so many people fighting for cannabis. But after the recreational laws passed, nobody really wants to fight for cannabis anymore. They're like, oh, I can smoke weed, so it's good. So my advice to you guys in Europe is to just always keep pushing. I was holding marches all the time. I was holding events for patients where patients can come for free and just talk to each other and say, oh, I'm using cannabis for this, and it helps me. And I'm using, you know, maybe Jack Hero for this, and I'm using White Widow for this. It helps me for this. So a place where patients can come together and talk because, I don't know <laughs> how to say this without sounding too facetious, but like the government and big business wants to keep us not together. You know, they want to keep us, you know, from people like you from not hearing messages from people like me. So the main thing is to just support activists, support your local activists if you can, because it's hard for people like me to do this. Or become one. <laughs> yeah, especially when you could get jailed all the time. Like I said, I spent two years in jail. It was not fun. Um, but I know also at the same time, I wouldn't be here with cannabis. And I think everybody deserves access to cannabis. Everybody should be allowed to grow this at home. And so I'm going to continue to fight for cannabis. I'm going to continue to come to expos all around the world until that happens. And I also believe, take it a step further, that cannabis should be allowed to be consumed publicly in the same areas tobacco can be consumed. Why not? Um, there is no harm about cannabis harming children or secondhand smoke harming children. That's not true. Um, it's true with, with carcinogenic tobacco, which kills people, and that's, that's legal, and you can smoke it anywhere, but uh, you can't smoke cannabis. And to me, I just think that it's, it's our human right. This is, this is a plant that was given to us by God, by Buddha, by whoever you want, by Mother Nature. This is a plant, it grows naturally, you know? If none of us were here, cannabis would grow. And then who would the police take to jail for the plant that grows naturally? You know what I mean? It's, it's a natural plant. And, and really, the more I do this, the more I learn how really strong and how powerful cannabis is that they want to keep it from us. So be, just be happy that you're a part of the enlightened people that know about cannabis because it really is an amazing plant and you can do so many amazing things. Since I cured my own Crohn's disease with cannabis oil, I put it online, I put it on social media saying I was cured. Everybody started to message me and they said, oh, my mother has cancer, or my brother has glaucoma, or my sister has a glioblastoma brain tumor. Can you make oil for me? Can you teach me how to make oil? Can you do anything for me? And I, I always do everything I can. I teach them how to make it, uh, send them the videos how to make it. I have them available online on the Mike Wise Show Facebook page. And I send the oil all over the world. So for three or four years now, I've been putting in the post high THC cannabis oil all around the world, to all the countries all around the world, even the crazy dangerous ones like Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand because people are messaging me and they need this and they don't know where to get it. They shouldn't have to go to their black market dealer and go into the bad part of town where the people with guns, you know, and cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine, they shouldn't have to buy cannabis from these people. You know, I shouldn't be the one who's ha having to make cannabis for everyone. Everyone should be able to make it. 
And so I just really believe that what I do is, is nothing really that I do is guided by what's legal. My actions are guided by, by what I feel is what's right and what's morally right to do. And that's why I'm here telling you everything. Um, you can public, you can, my website is public, OG Labs Genetics. You go there, anywhere in the world, you can buy THC oil, just click, click a few buttons, and it'll show up at your door. Traditionally, uh, Denmark is around 20 or 30 years behind America. Um, whatever happens in America usually happens here later. So with you knowing what you know now, um, is there anything you can tell us that we could um, stop this particular evolution here? Because it feels like it feels like the snowball of just of legalization has started in Denmark, right? Yeah. That 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 this this is going to happen at some point. Well, um, that's that's cool and that's great and all, but what if we end up on the same journey uh, towards big business, towards more control, towards... My best advice is to just always keep fighting to not let that happen. So, if big business comes in, which they already have, and big pharmaceutical company comes in, which they already have, you don't necessarily have to fight and be against what they're doing, but you have to make sure that they allow for us to do what we want to do at the same time. As you can see from me telling you this today, I've helped easily over 3,000 people, I think, at this point with cannabis oil. Like, I've given it to them directly to their, to their house, and they've cured some type of disease with this cannabis oil. <coughs> and as you can see, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not wearing a lab coat. You know, I don't have a stethoscope, and I don't charge people money to, just to talk to me. I, um, I try to provide the oil for as low cost as I can. I generally sell for around 30 euros per gram. Most people sell for 100 euros per gram. So the main thing to focus on is to keep, make sure that there's a place for people like me, a place for people like you, a place for people like you guys in legislation. Don't let the big businesses and the big pharmaceutical companies shut us out of legislation. These are our laws that we're living under them. Yeah. So we should be able to enjoy them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And we can uh, take questions. Has anybody got any questions for Mike? <laughs> look like one. <laughs> the address on the website. Uh, OG Labs Genetics. Com, OGLabsGenetics.com. I also have a booth here. It's number 46. And we have pamphlets. So um, you can, the website's on the back. Uh, the other thing is, you don't have to be embarrassed or worried about asking me a question that might be private. Um, you can send me a message. You know, you don't have to talk to me right now. You can send me a message on my on my Facebook page, and it might take me a week. Sometimes it might even take me two weeks. I'm not going to lie. But I answer every single message. So if you have any questions about cannabis or anything, feel free to, to ask me, because I'm here for the patients. Yes, I was thinking, uh, do you have any ideas how to implement uh, this in Denmark? You know, like you're saying, we're fighting against the lawmakers. Yeah. So we're sort of trying to find an agreement. Do you have any suggestions how we could? do that, like we in some sort of way? Uh... Well, it's really tough, and I'll tell you why. It's because a lot of the times, politicians, and really doctors for that matter, they play ignorant. They, they make it seem like they don't know. They're like, oh, I don't know about cannabis, or it's bad. But really, at this point, most of these people now know that it is good, and they now know that it does help people with, with medical diseases, and they know that it doesn't cause black men to rape white women. You know, this, this, this is all old, stereotypical stuff. But the politicians were saying this back then for the same reasons that they're still, today, pretending to not know about it. The politicians make money by making laws that hurt us. You know, because we don't pay politicians to make laws for us. The businesses out here, they pay the politicians to make laws for them. So it's a really tough question about how to do it. Uh, I always say to be active, um, I'll kind of give you some tips. Um, forming marches is great, like I said, events. 
you don't have to have a huge expo. You can have this many people in a small room anywhere. You can meet once a week, twice a week. You can talk about anything. We meet once a month. Um, another great way to help legalization happen is to, is to support activists like myself. Of course, if you have a huge activist in Denmark, share their stuff, share their, their stories and talk about them. And same thing with patients. If you have patients here in Denmark that taking cannabis oil and you can tell that it helps them, Share their stories. Tell people, hey, have you heard about this guy? He's using cannabis had, oil. Uh, we have had some very good examples of that at this conference here. I think the best one was Friday when we had uh, two uh, patients who suffered from multiple sclerosis telling their story, as well as Crystal Henriksen, who is uh, the lead woman of Cannabon.dk, who uh, she, after years of trial and error with conventional medicine, she cured her son of epilepsy. Wow. Or so, yeah. during all this. So the stories are there, and the Danish stories, the relevant Danish stories are here, uh, and they need to be shared. Uh, Marina Kirkva, uh, a nurse from Bonhoeffer, who uh, was fired when she publicly said that she uh, used CBD, was here earlier today. Her story is she was on the news and on the TVVs and all that stuff. The stories are there, and they need to be shared. I also think, if I may, yeah, yeah. to have the balls to take the micro activism as well. When you're sitting in a social context where you hear someone, it could be like a party at the workplace or a family gathering or something, and you hear someone of a conservative mind say, oh, those Dan, uh, well, take the debate. And when you do take the debate, don't fall into the very easy trap of believing your opponent to be dumb. I got something exactly to add to this, and that's a great point that you brought up, Nils, is that when you talk to people who are of the conservative mindset, whether the politicians or not, just like these stories that I'm telling you to share, share those stories. So a lot of times a politician or someone, you know, a conservative person will say, oh, well, what about cannabis for children? Or something like this. Just to purposely kind of get you into some, to say something, you know? Ignore those questions. Don't answer them. You can only say, well, I know that this cannabis works for this person and it works for me. Or you I could, can't talk about anything else because you, I don't know about that. Right there you could say cannabis for children. That sounds like an e excellent idea. If these children have, have epilepsy and you use a, a non-THC containing oil specifically designed for children. If you want, I can show you Crystal Henriksen's website. Like that there are Right now, we have examples. Yeah, I'm sure hundreds of them. Right. Really, I mean, they're just maybe not as popular as they should be. And, and it's because people aren't sharing them. And until you guys show these stories, um, it's the easiest, because it's undeniable. If you see a child, you know, or someone who, who's using cannabis, maybe Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, you can see immediately that cannabis has a positive effect. So no politician, no conservative, no person, no prohibitionist, can say that that's bad. Mm. No one, it's, 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 it's undeniable, it works, it's a medicine. Just, just to get back into the, uh, to the thing about um, not having big business in the uh, cannabis industry, mm -hmm. isn't the best way to kind of avoid that, to just tell people to grow themselves and then be honest about it, tell people that they're growing weed and that this is the way to do it? Because yeah. I think that's, that's also kind of a micro-activism, but, but that's, that's kind of the only way you can actually avoid it, because if people didn't grow it, then they would have to buy it and buy it from the big businesses, because the big businesses always keep the small businesses. Yeah, and I would say that's actually much bigger than micro-activism. It was one of the next things I was going to recommend to also do to help legalization is to grow it yourself. That's a way to normalize it. That's a way that you can have plants in front of people. And of course, if you're growing it yourself, don't show people plants. You know, Keep it private and that kind of thing. Help patients and let those kind of people know. But what I mean by showing plants is that hemp seeds are pretty readily available. And so you can throw hemp seeds around and let, let cannabis just grow naturally. You know, I heard people, they say, feed the birds. Give the hemp seeds to the birds and the birds will poop them out and the hemp plants will grow, you know, all around. But, it, but it's really true. Until, until we can all grow it ourselves and until we all do. So forget if we can, you know. If we can is waiting for a politician to tell us to do it. If we all do it, 
then we all have cannabis, and we all have it. You know, what are they going to do at that point? I would like to play a very short part of the devil's advocate here while we're talking about big business. Because they're having heard these stories during the conference these last couple of days, there is a point of medicinal cannabis. Like, what is it, 477 different cannabinoids having been identified now? There is a point where, especially Kestel, who used cannabis for a child, was like, I will only take this oil from this company because I know they have the certification and the third party. Yeah. And so, in my mind, after hearing all of these and also hearing you, I think we need to find a way to where the private grower can privately grow. And if you, as a sick person, finds a way of treating yourself, that should be the option. While we still allow the big businesses to do the big research that costs a fuck ton of money. Because there's so much potential in this plant that um, I think we need to find the, the golden solution. Well, that's funny, because I'll tell you a little counterpoint to that is that, yes, I'm definitely not against big business, let's let them do whatever they want, as long as it's fair and they let us do whatever we want. I mean, really, when you're getting down into capitalism, it's all about the free market, right? Well, the free market means me and you should be able to sell cannabis freely just as they can. It, a free market doesn't mean that only one person can do it because they have $1 million to buy a license. That's no longer a free market. That's no longer capitalism. Um, and so, so, this the counterpoint I was going to say it was on research and and that's another thing is that research is one of those things that a lot of people will say oh well there's not enough research and that's one thing I don't really I'm not really going to get into that one because there is tons of research but in from what I've seen all the research is done it th that there isn't really a such thing as research all there is is a a paid advertisement from a pharmaceutical company that's what we call research so when a research study is done Merrick or Bayer or somebody gives some scientists $10 million and they say, we want you to prove this. And if they can't prove this, well then right away Bayer says, oh, we're closing this study and this study's no good. This is a bad study. But so, are those the only studies being made? I spoke to Srini Vasoredi from uh, Canadian uh, Leaf Cross. Uh, this is pharmaceutical. He showed, me, he showed me on his computer here yesterday, he just opened up and showed me 13,000 Exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's papers. more than that. Like, surely not all of them are. Well, you'd be surprised. Um, a lot of, at least in the United States, a lot of there was a lot of research being done in the 70s, and then it got suppressed. The government paid the scientists to to study cannabis independently, and the scientists started finding out that cannabis was harmless. So as soon as they found that out, the government shut down the study and told those scientists to stop researching it, or they'll be fired. So um, I was specifically referring to big pharmaceutical companies, yes. but there is cannabis companies who are coming up uh, the last four or five years, well, 10 years really, and they're doing studies which seem to be independent, but I can't really no. know for sure. So I guess with anything else, source criticism. Well, that's the thing. Always question the source and always ask yourself, you know, don't just take the headline and the story for what it says. Think about it critically and ask questions. No, and, and it, it really is like history repeats itself, and it's yeah. kind of crazy. The more I think about it, uh, more on an abstract level, is that it really, to me, seems like we're still living under a feudalism, like a different type of feudalism, where um, instead of a king or queen being in charge, which in some of these countries it still is a king or queen, but we have governments. <laughs> but all these governments are all controlled by big business, and it's all, they really want you to work 24 hours a day or as much as you can. And I guess this is, of course, in the U.S. perspective. I know you guys are a little more social 
um, with your work uh, stuff in, in uh, Denmark, but um, they want you to work yourself to death, really, for the company. And they want you to pay all the taxes and always be in debt. So you're just drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and killing yourself, and you're not really thinking critically about what the government's doing. You know, you're not really thinking like, oh, maybe that's bad, you know? Maybe the water in Flint, Michigan should be regular water and not filled with rust that's killing people, <laughs> you know? It's like, maybe police shouldn't be killing black people in the United States. You know, maybe America shouldn't be fighting wars all across the world and killing third world peoples so we could get cheaper oil. Maybe we shouldn't be doing these things, you know? And so, cannabis really is one of those things, a lot of people use it spiritually. Jamaica, the Rastafarians, they, their whole culture is, is literally consumed by consuming cannabis. And you have this spiritual awakening when you smoke cannabis. You start to question things. You're like, wait, this isn't right. And maybe, I was told this when I was a kid, but maybe it's not right, you know? Maybe Christopher Columbus really did murder a whole bunch of Indians and he didn't find, you know, a land magically, you know? There's, there's all sorts of things. And, it's like a journey. Once you start with cannabis, and you really, if you want to keep going with it, you'll learn all sorts of crazy things. Um, a point I came to think about when I uh, heard you talk was, uh, it seems to me that the debate, the legalization debate in Denmark is being uh, tainted or tarnished, I don't know what to call it, by the fact that cannabis is both a medicinal and a recreational plant. And it seems like the it seems like we have two debates, <coughs> Excuse me. but because it's the the debate stems from the same plant, then uh, the debates get muddled, especially with politicians who might have a conservative opinion about cannabis, but not actually knowing what's going on. So you'll have, uh, whenever we say, we need medicinal cannabis, they hear all these stoners just want to sit down and get stoned. <laughs> um, no, it's pretty funny. I've experienced a lot of the same criticism myself in my journeys. And um, so when I used to talk to these conservative politicians, I didn't actually tell you guys this part of my story, but um, when I was taking the oil for Crohn's disease, the first 45 grams I took orally in my mouth, the second 45 grams I took in a suppository in my butt. So whenever a politician wants to tell me, oh, you know, medical cannabis, this is just to get high, I'm like, well, I'm putting it in a suppository. You know, I'm not smoking this. This is actually for medical use. Um, and, and the whole thing, for the reason that you stated, Nils, is why I don't talk about recreational cannabis and legalizing it. For that reason, is because I'm avoiding that stigma personally. But this whole talk about medical and recreational comes from big business. <laughs> Before the recreational laws happened, we never talked about cannabis and said it was recreational cannabis. That was never, that word didn't exist. There was medical cannabis. Um, and so that alone, medical and recreational, is a fight, you know, that, that they've caused and a wedge they've caused. And I have noticed it here in a different way because in the EU they're very touchy about food regulations and things like this. And medical, you know, you can't say certain things and this kind of thing. And I guess I could just always say be, be weary of anybody who tells you what you can and can't say. You know, you should be able to say what you want, especially if you know it's right. I just thought of a point right now. Uh, American stand-up comedian Doug Stanhope, who I admire much, yeah. uh, came to mind here when he said, um, there is no such thing as addiction. Boredom is a disease worse than cancer. Drugs cure it with little, no side effects if used as directed. But I guess that's the point as well that uh, I know many people and I know myself have used cannabis also when I've been feeling bad mentally. So maybe if we like take this thought journey to an end, recreational cannabis is medicinal cannabis. And that's, <laughs> that's a really funny thing because I tell people this every time they bring it up and I, and I say it in kind of a more like confrontative or combative way and I just say that there is no, all use is medical, all use is medicinal. A lot of people will say, well, you know, I just, I'm a recreational user because I just want to smoke a joint after a long, hard day of work. Well, guess what? You're doing that to relax. That's, that's a medical use right there. 
and, um, and, and even if you want to play devil's advocate, like we've done today a few times. Okay, well let's say THC is bad, and let's say that it is psychoactive. Well, so is alcohol, right? <laughs> and that's legal. So if THC is so psychoactive, why don't we just make it legal and control it the same way? Yeah. Like they don't want to do that. They don't want to have bars where you can go take cannabis shots or do dab, uh, dabs in a bar. Uh, uh, the other point of uh, gateway drugs, right? That's always the thing people bring up. Uh, if you ever get into the gateway drugs debate, just say to people, I have never met someone who smoked a joint that hadn't first tasted a beer. Which means that <laughs> evidently beer is a gateway drug to cannabis, <laughs> which is of course a gateway drug to heroin, which means that beer is a gateway drug to heroin. <laughs> so why are you coming after cannabis? Yeah, and you could take that even a step further. And uh, I personally have made cannabis oil for dozens of people who were addicted to heroin, who were addicted to methamphetamine, or who were addicted to some sort of really serious drug. They took cannabis oil, now they're not addicted to it anymore. So it's actually not a gateway drug, it's a therapy to get people off of drugs. And it's, it's really amazing what it is. I mean. That, I really can't stress it enough, is that this should tell you how powerful the plant is that they want to keep it from us this badly. And uh, <laughs> on that bombshell, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Check out my show. <laughs> and with that, my dear friends, we conclude the conference from this year's North Grove Expo.